work. They were always on time. They were never late. They never spoke back when they were insulted. They worked. They never went on strike about permission. They never took days off that were not on the calendar. They worked ten days a week and were only paid for five. They worked, they worked. They worked and they died. They died broke. They died owing. They died never knowing what the front entrance of the first national city bank looks like. Juan, Miguel, Milagro, Olga, Manuel, all die yesterday, today, and will die again tomorrow, passing their bill collectors on to the next of kin. All die waiting for the Garden of Eden to open up again under a new management. All die dreaming about America. Waking them up in the middle of the night, screaming, Mira, Mira, your name is on the winning lottery ticket for $100,000. All die hating the grocery stores that sold them make-believe steak and bulletproof rice and beans. All die dreaming, hating, and waiting. Dead Puerto Ricans who never knew they were Puerto Ricans, who never took a coffee break from the Ten Commandments to kill, kill, kill the landlords of their cracked skulls and communicate with their Latin souls. Juan, Miguel, Milagro, Olga, Manuel, from the nervous breakdown street where the mice live like millionaires and the people do not live at all. They are dead, they are dead, and will not return from the dead until they stop neglecting the art of their dialogue for broken English lessons to impress the system who keeps them employed as lava platos, porters, messenger boys, factory workers, may stock clerks, shipping clerks, assistant mailroom assistant, assistant assistant to the assistant, assistant, assistant lava platos, and automatic artificial smile endowment for the lowest wages of the ages and rages when you demand a raise because it's against the company policies to promote speaks, speaks, speaks. Here lies Juan, here lies Miguel, here lies Milagros, here lies Olga, here lies Manuel, who died yesterday, today, and will die again tomorrow, always broke, always owing, never knowing that they are beautiful people. Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. Thomas Jefferson declared back in 1786 that the United States must be, quote, viewed as the nest from which all America, North and South, is to be peopled. This is what we're ready to receive, as he put it. Noam Chomsky has written that the United States is the one country that exists or ever has existed that was founded as an empire explicitly. While never officially identifying itself and its territorial possessions as an empire, American imperialism, the expansion of American political, economic, military, cultural, and media influence and might beyond its boundaries, began at the expense of Native Americans. It's continued up through the present through policies and doctrines such as, among others, American exceptionalism, the Monroe Doctrine, Manifest Destiny, White Man's Burden, neo-colonialism, and numerous interventionist wars and attempts of regime changes around the world. These policies have been primarily interested in opening up and securing international markets to surplus U.S. production. In practice, these attempts to politically and economically dominate has always been and continues to be the underlying reason for the massive Latino presence in the United States. That includes the almost three million Puerto Ricans whose colonial status allows them to live in America as de jure citizens. In reality, they continue to be regarded and treated as second-class, de facto foreigners. 
This largely overlooked history of revolution and terror in Puerto Rico from the United States invasion in, invasion in 1898 to over 50 years of military occupation and colonial rule from the unsuccessful armed insurrection in 1950 to the modern day struggle for self-determination and independence is the subject matter of our guest, Nelson Dennis's classic work, War Against All Puerto Ricans. Dennis was the editorial director of El Dario, the largest Spanish language newspaper in New York City. He's a graduate of Harvard University and Yale Law School. He served as a New York State Assemblyman from East Harlem from 1997 to 2001 and has written and directed many feature films that primarily the one we are going to be talking about today is Vote For Me, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. Nelson, thank you so very, very much for being here. It is really an honor and a pleasure to meet you for the first time, although we've been talking before the show and there is so much to talk about with this incredible book, The War Against All Puerto Ricans. Um, I thought I'd start by giving our audience a little bit of an idea of your writing style, which is so lyrical and, and, and just so moving and passionate. And uh, this is how your book starts. My mother was Puerto Rican. My father was Cuban. They worked very hard, and we lived in a small but spotless apartment in New York City's Washington Heights. I was eight years old when men from the FBI banged on our door at 3 a.m. No one understood what was happening. My mother screamed, my grandmother cried, and I hid behind a curtain. The FBI agents grabbed my father and took him away. We never saw him again. It was October 1962, the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and someone had denounced my father as a spy. There was no trial or administrative hearing, no evidence of due process. He was simply deported to Cuba. A few months later, Attorney General Robert Kennedy received his annual Immigration and Naturalization Service report, which stated, investigation of Cuban refugees uh, increased during this year under this pressure a number of Cubans alleged to be subversive departed prior to the completion of the investigations. These included your father, Antonio Dennis Jordan, suspected Cuban G2 agent in New York City. He was an elevator operator and a member of the janitor's union, 32BJSEIU. He supported the Cuban revolution and spoke in favor of it. He was a Cuban patriot, but he was not a spy. So what a way to open a book. It, personally, with, with, with family tragedy and how the political history of what Puerto Rico had been going through, had been through for many, many years, you got a very early intimate experience of that. And so this is what got you started with the book, right? And you expanded it to put this within a much greater social context and historical context, correct? Well, I just had a, a first told Jim, uh, you had me at hello. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for the Thank invitation. Thank you. It's and, uh, my honor. You know, Felipe, our, our mutual friend uh, well, in absentia, he's still a... I, yes, he's our he, friend. And Felipe Luciano uh, was was supposed to come uh, with us today. Uh, he did get sick, but we'll have him on. We'll do this again. He has a very quiet command. He called me and said, he said, Nelson, I need you to come to this on, on Jim's show. He said, I, I, I said, well, Felipe, yeah. I can't, you know, who am I to defy, you know, no, I'll, I'll be we, we don't defy Felipe. Um, <laughs> but, but your question is, Thank uh, you. what yeah. I was undergoing was a life experience. I mean, I was eight years old. I wasn't aware of, you know, all I know is my father was, you know, suddenly gone. Right, but, and it takes some time to, you know, the the benefit of very long range and uh, highly nuanced hindsight to realize how little vector it sums, little things that are, yeah, that move you one direction or the other. Early on, mm. they predetermine so many things in, in your in your life, and that 
I become aware that that is part of my Puerto Rican experience. The fact that a, um, hmm. a, a hmm. emotionally, psychologically, almost neurologically, there's a there's a sense of a glass ceiling, a, a, a limit to 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 your imagination and to possibilities. There are things that I wanted to do. Um, I mean, I worked really hard, um, but there was you know there, there was always a, a, a sense of limitation or um, of, or foreboding. Um, and well, it's that's a, it's part a, of the Puerto Rican character. It's I a do. huge, tra I mean, you can't, uh, you know, it, it's a traumatic, um, incredible pr uh, traumatic experience. So, what, so here's what so happened. So gradually, yeah, the sense so you made. Sudden, yeah, um, we were, my father was not a spy. He didn't speak no. very good English. So you, what kind of a spy are you going to be? You can't, you know, you're spying on a country. You don't understand, uh, you know, what's, what's going on. But he did have uh, extensive meetings. And that's what made him a target. He, people came every Saturday. Uh, he was an inspiring guy. He was big oh. and solid. He yeah. used to be a soccer player. Uh, it was America, like, right? That's what it's supposed to be about. Well, he, yeah, he came here. That's how he met my mother. They were working in the uh, garment district, uh -huh. uh, sewing belts. You know, what could be more, uh, you know, um, America, the immig immigrant experience of coming and working for sub-minimum wages. They weren't a member of ILGWU. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, and they... I guess they had, you know, a lot of shared life. They were going through so much that was in common that it, that it made sense for them to, to get. She married. was born uh, also right in Puerto Rico. My mother was born well, in Caguas, and your father was. My born father was born in the Canary Islands. Canary, he was Canary originally, Islands. Originally, you know, Spanish and French. Okay. And he went to uh, Cuba. He was born essentially raised in, in, in Cuba. But he was radicalized by what he saw there hmm. by the time that, that he came here. What I didn't realize is how formative these are, and we, you know, I mean, we, you look back, you say, now I understand how, the, the, you know, these things that influence my character, my decision making, my sense of what, you know, what, uh, how I react. Um, I, I, but you reacted by being a really, really good student. I was a fat kid, right? Yeah. But I was smart. Very slim. And, and I, what I, 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 that was my cudgel. <laughs> that was my sort of my, the, there was a sort of Damocles over our family because mom suddenly, when, you know, when they took my father away, she suddenly had to, with her seamstress salary, yeah. she had three mouths to feed, my yeah. grandmother, ma, herself, and, and me. You. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think instinctively I realized that there, we, were, we didn't have much margin for error. Um, and the one thing that I could do was just not be, a, not get, be a, a, any additional burden or problem. Uh, um, and I kind, of, I, I kind of enjoyed the one thing that I was good at, which was I was a good, I was a good student. It just, it just yeah, happened yeah, that, you know. And, yeah. and apparently, I didn't realize that for all of that turmoil and all that, that suffering, uh, my mother, my family, they created a peaceful home. They, somehow it was filled mm. with love and security. I never missed a meal. Mm. I had en enough sense of self and uh, self-esteem that it was, for me, was inarguable. It was, of course I was going to go to Of course I was going to go to I was just, and that was created by these two beautiful women, my, my mom and my grandma. My father, yeah. he was the disciplinarian. He made me start reading at age three. Reading Bohemia, the the, uh, the right. Cuban revolutionary magazine, I remember crying. But I, I, by the time I went to school, I could read it in Spanish, you know, fairly well. English so was uh, was not my first language. Mm -hmm. I went to school. Essentially, the only thing I read, I watched Looney Tunes, The Mickey Mouse Club, and Modern Farmer at six in the morning on Saturdays. I think I vaguely remember that Modern, and they would tell you what the the, tractor, the weather the, is to going to be yeah. today and how to. So yeah. you're we yeah I, I don't yeah weird shows but anyway yeah so but you five o'clock in the morning you were up watching this and probably reading and stuff so these these women really shielded yeah. you from but, this yeah. trauma and pain and but yeah. as you got older uh, you, you never felt let me put it this way because uh, I know you I never felt you know we're I never felt poor and never I never felt, felt limitation limita not, not not consciously. But there were things that, well, the, the, the life has a way of shaping and, you know, it's very, you know you're malleable. But, but did you feel that you were part of a colonialized people? Did you have that mindset? Was that given to you? So it doesn't seem like it was. No, at that oh, but point. I did know. But on some level, yeah. I knew that someone could come and take my father at yeah. 2 in the morning and I'd never Absolutely. see him again. That is like, you know, that's a very profound right. incursion in, into your psyche. Um, so, although I, I didn't... But the it, connection I was because of the political viewpoints in support of independence of Puerto Rico. I mean, did you, uh, you didn't put that 
No. I, that took a uh, while I, for I that to develop, right? I didn't even the Cuban Missile Crisis. I didn't right, right, right. No, together. sure. So, but they were, they, they bureaucrat, people, heads were rolling. People didn't want to lose their job. They got caught, you know, short with right. suddenly these missiles. So everybody was like musical chairs, and my father was an easy target. He didn't speak you know, very good English. He had dozens of people. I can say this now. Um, easy, my yeah. father was recruiting people. Uh, he was collecting money, uh, medicine, and, and armaments. Mm. I was really impressed as I, I saw, you know, they had this, this hope chest filled, you know, with big, you know, mm. I don't know what kind of gun, but there was, you know, they were, very, you know, I said, wow, I mean, my father's into something, but, but he, was, he, he wasn't shooting those guns. He was just, you know, he was an, an, an organizer. Okay, um, okay. But they turned that into accusing him of being a G2 spy. G2, by the way, is like uh, MI6, MI5, and, or 007. It's like license to kill level of, hmm. of spy. Dumb. Yeah, this, your I mean, father doesn't sound like that. No, oh, okay. no, he wasn't like no. But when did this sort of political historical consciousness about all of this come to your mind? Was it at, at Harvard there? Or it, yeah, how it long did that take? It was personal. Um, right. Because and how was I, it growing up I, in, 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 in you were in Washington Heights there, right? I grew up in Washington Heights. I, I got so you, a scholarship without unwittingly. I never heard of the place, a place called Taft in Connecticut. Okay. And I got a, a full scholarship. The reason I went there is because they had soccer teams with the uniforms. And that's, that, for me, was dispositive. I said, because I really You were still soccer. this big husky kid? I was still pretty, yeah. Oh. yeah well, not husky. Said, we'll call you husky. That's what they, it was husky. That's what they, well, yeah, they don't have husky anymore, do they? <laughs> I was husky too. So, yeah. <laughs> No, they probably don't. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, so but you're not husky now. Anyway, so the point is, so you went to Taft. You said, uh, yeah. You and, um, so this, I, yeah. I, I, tell I, me. I'm sorry. I don't mean I'll look at the camera on this. But I'm proud. I call up every year to make sure that my record is intact. Uh, so I'm this Puerto Rican kid. I'm uh, full scholarship at, at Taft, and to this day, I'm the only uh, student to get a hundred on the algebra final exam. Well, yeah. At, at Taft. And when I did that, I think it sent repercussions to the faculty. They were, they were like, this kid, this kid, you know. They all, How I, much did it mean to be, you just said that, I'm a Puerto Rican kid. How much did that, for, did it, you, did it was that a really sink Because I knew I was a smart kid. Right. So, but I was so really happy that I was smarter okay. than these motherfuckers. I'm sorry. That no, these no, white we're, guys. We can say whatever, yeah. You know, I said, okay. and so, and I just <laughs> quietly, you know, just, was, I was just me. I was very, I, I was, uh, I think I was pretty obnoxious. The upperclassmen didn't like me because I was really So far you sound like a real... <laughs> If I may, a little Jew, a, a good, a Jewish, a, a Jewish kid who is For getting that, back. I sent at, you to Connecticut. You know, I, I, you know, this, yeah, yeah. I'll get I'll back. You should be paid to such a Puerto Rican. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here so, you are, and then yeah. So so, so the uh, consciousness um, begins. You know the yeah. best year. I'm sorry, I'm getting. We're not quite. But no, we're, we're just having a good. We're gonna have. Do you know the happiest year of my life was my first year at Taft because I yeah. got into fights. In, in Washington Heights all the time. They accuse me of being Jewish. People that, <laughs> uh, okay, Puerto Rican, you have a, I go to so Catholic school. Double whammy. They, yeah. yeah, because I was this pain in the ass kid. I was always, I wouldn't just raise my hand. I would be this, ooh, ooh. Because, oh, and, yeah. And nobody I mean, liked yeah. me. So yeah. I got into fights all the time. I mean, they would, and my style of fighting was really jejun. I, I had no, I would say, go ahead, hit me, hit me, go ahead, hit me. They would hit me. I'd say, hit me again, because I needed, I'm, not, I'm kind of a peaceful guy. So I had to get into a blind rage. So they would hit me like 10 times. Oh, no. And at that point, I'm ready yeah. to fight, but the fight's over. I've already been hit 10 times. You, the, rope a dopey, uh, even so then. I, so I, you know, but yeah. I learned how to fight by getting beat up a lot. So I became tough, you know, sort of inadvertently. Yeah, you're a smart guy. That doesn't sound too smart, but I, I get no, your but point. No, I, I got uh, the tap. You know what happened in tap? No. We they, got, uh, <laughs> they sent me the- Remember, we got your whole book to go uh, through. And there so, was a guy, remember, right, his name is Richard Manners. It's not live, but Richard, we were playing around <laughs> uh, without going in, in, in depth. And they, go ahead, they no, stuck go me ahead. in a closet, and they put a, a bureau, and then he, but here's the thing, he opened the closet, he called me a spick, and he spat on me. Wow. And, and, and so With this waspy so sort of yeah, blonde guy, yeah. and so, Biff and that, or somebody. And so, oh, and sort of like right. penetrated that, you know, that veneer. I suddenly, uh, something just, I, mm. I thought I was in a friendly place, but that one, and so here's what, I became so blind. I just, you know that, that a mother can, when they lift their child, they can lift the, uh, you know. This, yeah, 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 yeah. You this, got this the adrenaline came. going. I just, and then I, like, I went kind of blank for like five minutes, and I just, pummeled them all around the room and somebody finally had to stop me really? and then he was wow. gone for two weeks yeah that's orthodontia they had i mean Whoa. apparently you know and so nobody bothered me after that attack no because this guy he's not he's, he was i was still kind of a little chunk no i get it and, I and get he's it. smart but that mother, that guy don't you know there's like he's like dr jekyll and mr hyde 
But I'm pulling yeah. you toward because we, so your energy right. so, started getting channeled. Well, it was at Someone Harvard. more productive. It was at okay. They went to Harvard. Um, <laughs> they, have, uh, they have three million Incredible. books. Uh, they private themselves out. Right. Seven miles of books have subterranean chambers and wider, you know, like 12 right. flo floors. Of and so and I, was, you know, I was curious about the Pedro Albizu Campos, the seminal, Campos. pivotal Puerto Rican Campos. in our history. And, our, and he, right. went to, he was the first Puerto Rican at to Harvard. Go to Harvard and Harvard Law School. And so I, you know, I figured, you know, I, you know I, I, those are good, good shoes. This is back follow. when, in the 20s 19, and 30s? 1972. 72? Yeah. No, so no, I'm, you, no, when was uh, Campos at, at Harvard? Oh, he, uh, 1920, uh, early 20s. 20s, so yes, okay. Yeah. And well, before that, then he went to war. He was a captain in the U.S. Army during yes. you know, World War One, and then because Puerto Rico's army. Puerto Ricans were citizens then. Yeah, we, 1917. We, we, right? we became citizens as of 1917. That's yeah. right. But yeah, so the not the Jones Shafroth Act. And you'll explain all of this because it's yeah. it's the, the you're, difference between the Jones Act and the Jones Shafroth Act. Right. We'll get into that. But I mean, um, but you're not a so state. Here's the thing. You're a commonwealth. Uh, I want okay. to make this point. Good. So I go to Widener, and there was not one book, monograph, mm. or piece of information on Don Pedro Albizu. I went, you know, it, it yeah. was a Dewey Decimal system back then. Um, and so, but I, I got really curious about this. So I contrived to get a job as a, you know, assistant librarian, you know, a, a, my work study, mm. in, so that I could read. So for like mm. two or three months, they were paying me to do further research. <laughs> try, and I still, I didn't find, I said, ain't this something? I said, there's like this mm. missing, as, as, and, and so it was just, I find that really curious, and that, that sparked, uh, uh, you know, no. sort of a... Well, it's know, unfair. A, it was, it was... Yeah. And a what, deep what curiosity. And a, a, a narrative that remained un, untold. Yeah. It was necessary. Yeah. So, so I kept that, in, and, and uh, I made it sort of like a personal pet project. I majored in government, um, but I didn't write, I, I didn't write a thesis. I should have, I could, you know, because I wrote a pretty... Uh, a very well documented, and it was like m more of a labor of love right. um, that became the cover story of the Harvard Political Review my senior year, Rose and it was out there the, about the curious, it was called the Curious Constitution of Puerto Rico, and it was about the interrelation of Pedro Albizu Campos' aborted revolution in relation to uh, the, uh, the, the public relations battle between the Soviet Union and the United States. The United States could ill afford, as, as the ostensible leader of the free world, to have the only classic colony in, uh, remaining on the planet, Puerto Rico. So that was your, so, what was the reaction to that article? Actually, it was, I was, I was surprised. The governor of, uh, of, of Connecticut, Ned Lamont, who I knew from Harvard, uh, well, from Harvard and from other mutual friends at, at Taft, came up to, and he, and, and he just, he, that you know, the, the fact that this you know really super waspy guy had read it you know and, and you know in, re in great detail and he was really curious he said I had no idea about that and I said you know Ned mm. I didn't know this either man I had no idea that there was a, it's like it's Orwellian um, what happens in, in Vegas stays in Vegas mm -hmm. but what happens in Puerto Rico never happened at all it's like a parallel uh, universe in fact the very year and that you think that was structured I'm sorry because I'm so this is so interesting so. From the very beginning, this was the idea to sort of keep Puerto Rico as this paradise island that we think of, but in fact, it's being dominated and controlled for, f by all kinds of financial instruments and economic forces uh, from the United States. I mean, you're unco beginning to uncover yeah, that, I, right? but I think it's unfortunately more nefarious than that because uh, when you, you can deal yeah, with, you know, yeah, with intent, with it. Um, right, right. it is through absolute uh, in. Uh, Inattention, like nobody, uh, I think, really collaborated or conspired. It was just m much deeper than that. It just we don't we don't didn't exist. You have to realize that Puerto Rico originally back then was separated by four centuries of Ibero-American history, separated by a language, separated by technology. Uh, it would take a steamer a vessel five days in that. At yeah. that time, to just make it from Puerto Rico up to New York or, or Washington, hmm. so it was really isolated, and yeah. all the information was mediated by several AP and UPI wire service reporters who would simply file regurgitate. Uh, uh, they weren't investigative reports. No, no they, they, they were they just, would, it, it, you know, yeah, I got it. They would have a good time, you know. They'd right. file out the reports that were yeah, given to them by the, by the Puerto Rican government, and, yeah, and the Puerto Rican government consisted of, of, of uh, U.S. appointed governors, handpicked. Yeah, yeah. Like the first, go if I may, you know, r range around. Please. Can I go into some quick history? Absolutely. Please, our audience, and, and my, uh, right. we would love that. Go All ahead. Right. United Please. States, when it, it was really, and Albizu Campos said, this wasn't a war, this was a, uh, or, or a, a treaty of Versailles. Or, it was, uh, 
the Paris Accord was a real estate transaction where Puerto Rico was part of the spoil, spoils of war and it was um, perceived as a naval, the value as a naval coaling station uh, uh, so that the ships could, you know, refuel and that it was geopolitically, you know, well positioned. It was the first major landmass, not big, but Cuba was, you know, off to, you know, further away. So coming from Europe, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Puerto Rico was very well positioned, you know, transnationally. And so that was the perceived value of Puerto Rico as a naval coaling station. And sure enough, uh, Roosevelt Road was the largest naval base in the world for about 30 years. They really? Got, yeah. Wow. Yeah, they had about 600 acres, and they spent $230 million, which is, you know, current. Uh, and a lot of it on cost-plus contracts that went to uh, U.S. Uh, it was sort of sole source, sure. and they, they, they grew the money to U.S. contractors. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The United States goes in in 1898. 1899, the largest hurricane of the century, Flattened Puerto Rico, destroyed all the, you know the coffee crop and you know, all the varied. Puerto Rico had a, had a self-sustaining, diversified agriculture. It was eighty percent of its uh, economy consisted of, of you know exporting agriculture back in eighteen ninety eight. Mm -hmm. So the United States go in eighteen ninety nine. It's sort of like Naomi Klein's shock capitalism. Yeah, in yeah. eighteen ninety nine, the hurricane because the United States had no meaningful hurricane relief. Instead, the following year in nineteen hundred, they devalued the Puerto Rican currency from a dollar to 60 cents. Every, they declare the, United, United, the, the currency now of Puerto Rico is going to be the U.S. dollar, and everyone has to hand in their, their, their peso, which was a mm. roughly equivalent buying power internationally. The Spanish, it was based on the Spanish peso as right. the American dollar. Up but until that point. Then that point. depreciation. So, so yeah. it was a straight up depreciation. So now you have less. For, yeah. for, and Overnight. Concomit yeah. Yes. And concomitantly, your debts now are 40% higher. Right. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. Wow. I mean, think about when, when the World Trade Center, when right. th you know, we have, you know, relative, you know, very tragic events, but right. compare that to if in this, in this country, if yeah. you, we, we all wake up with 40, every government, every municipality, Co every corporate Bananas corporate, corporate, would, would every be tolerated. Right, this, the, it would be a social collapse. The mm -hmm. would, United States of America would no longer be the United States of America. A revolution. If there was such I mean, you could, uh, insurrection. Yeah. Yeah. The, the center doesn't hold. There would be no, there's been no center to speak of at, the, at this point. All right, so we have a hurricane, a currency devaluation, and that's in 1901. 1901, through the Hollander Act, a steeply graduated set of property taxes that had never uh, uh, existed in Puerto Rico before, le levied against who? The farmers, because you know, that was the economy of Puerto Rico. So now you have these triple hits, right? Hurricane, currency devaluation. So, the farmers need liquidity. They're desperate to hold on to their land. Mm. They had only one place to go. A, a prep league, it was called the American Colonial Bank. Mm. That was it. Uh, was that was, that was, uh, and yeah, it was like Phil Rizzuto at the money store. Yeah. Come on down. They gave them. They just wanted to give these loans. The United States, was. they were very aggressive. Knowing that they the wouldn't be able to pay it back. Exactly. The because they didn't, want the, they didn't want the money. They wanted the land. Right, 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 right. Wow. Now, when General Miles yeah. came in and he hoisted the, town, the old glory up the town flagpole in, in Ponce, when they... Who's General know, Miles? Now? General Miles was the head of the United States in, uh, Occupation Force okay. in, in the Spanish-American okay. War in Puerto Rico. Okay. So he declares, we have come here not to dominate, you know, but to, but to protect your, your, yourselves and your property and give you the blessings of enlightened civilization. To protect you, your interests, your property, and the blessings of enlightened civilization. White man's burden. Huh? The white man. Well, men's that burden was uh, <laughs> was tra translated Trans 20 or 30 years later. It's going to be your property. Burden. Yeah. 80 percent, 80 percent of the arable land in Puerto Rico was owned by North American banking, banking syndicates. And they, they turned them into centrales. And they, t they turned a previously diversified self-sustaining economy into a one crop cash cow economy that is sugar. Mm. Now, what the temp I'm sorry, I know I'm going on. No, sorry, this, we got this is wonderful, beautiful. This is so informative. So, Please go on, and go on. The first governor, American appointed governor, is the one that sent it to Plum people, Charles Herbert Allen. He shows up. He had been a congressman. He was, you know, pretty well connected from Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, and, and at Lowell. They had some textile mills uh, in right, his family. Right, right. Um, and he's a businessman. I mean, that's in his blood. So he comes in, and he only stayed governor for 17 months because he diverted a sub substantial enough portion of the, of the Puerto Rican budget from roads, or road repairs, schools. This man knew exactly what he was about. He, could, he, di he diverted that budget to conduct soil sample studies all over Puerto Rico, and he, f and he discovered that it was amongst the most fertile land that, that the United mm. States had any, any control over it. Right. Um, so he put that into his first year's fiscal report to President McKinley, but it wasn't really a fiscal report. <coughs> it was a business plan for taking over the, the Puerto Rican economy because mm. 
Two weeks after Charles Herbert Allen, the first U.S. appointed governor of Puerto Rico, handed in that fiscal report, he renounced his governor, he went to Wall Street, got a job at Wall Street at Morgan Stanley, he became a vice president at Morgan Stanley, then he became a, the treasurer, then president, then chairman of the board of the American Sugar Refining Corporation, wow, which wow, today is known, yeah. one of its subsidiaries Domino, today is Domino, Domino Sugar. Domino, yeah. Right, so now, what did he do? He Dominate had Domino. Uh, Domino, yeah. yeah Domino, Domino, yeah. yeah. So uh, he had uh, appointed over 660 expat U.S. expatriates into the Puerto Rican bureaucracy and they were at, at high salaries. People who didn't speak Spanish, but now they you know, have these you know, highfalutin government posts in Puerto Rico. They returned the favor by giving him repairing rights, sole source contracts, um, bundling of, 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 of lots, uh, okay, the inside tax information. Tax breaks? All sorts of tax yeah, subsidies, right? Yeah. So wh wh when they call it Operation, uh, when they call it Operation Bootstrap, Bootstrap Vito Macatoni called it Operation Booby Trap because it was always at the, for, for the favor right. of the. We're going to come in here and help you, yeah. but we're going to help our. Se go, go ahead. Yeah. So, so Charles Herbert Allen became the first sugar king of Puerto Rico. He hardwired the entire American economy at 600 over 600 plus people that were helping him, and when Wall Street saw the accelerated. Uh, you know, capitalist pr progress of this one man, because he was rapacious. I mean, he, it was all legal. He, he was yeah, yeah, governor, yeah. He was 17 months. It's just it. business and, as usual. Yeah. Business. And, Good and business. See, and that's why I said it's nefarious, because it's, it's like governed by algorithm, and it's become more, I'm kind of jumping forward, so I, and then yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah, reverse yeah. engineer, yeah. but right now, you can't even point at a particular enemy or a particular villain or bad guy because a lot of these uh, these decisions are made literally the computer uh, you know algorithms and, and, and Puerto Rico is like in the is is in the rifle barrel of of US capital and no system. one can really be held fully accountable and, and that's it's the beauty of it, right? Right? yeah right so so there's wow. been a, ever since Charles Herbert or the Allen, evilness of it it's structured because in. it's so bad it's like yeah. You can fight an adversary, but a zombie, it's like these, you know, they, yeah. and, and it's like impersonal, yeah. and they just take over, and there's no, no reasoning are, with them. Those are the, that's the law, that's and the rules. And they're very right. far away. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the lighter skinned, uh, better positioned, um, upper class, little caste system of Puerto yeah. Rico collaborates. And that's been the history. That's, right now, they have the PNP, the Partido Nacional por Puerto Rico, and the PPD, the Partido Popular Democrático, the PPD and PNP, the two parties. Okay. There's no two parties. There's one party, the PLP, the party of lining your pockets, because that's all, that's been the, that's been the case since the, the beginning. It's, it's the history of, and, and it's, very, it's, it's very difficult to, to create a, uh, um, to have traction, to, you know, to, to develop a solidarity when you're, Communication with the outside world is being mediated by a caste system, right. and they themselves, the elected representatives, and so then the United States can convene and say, "Well, wait, it's your governor that you know that put this law. Right. It's your governor that's, that right. put, created these subsidies, these twenty-year tax breaks for uh, interest, dividend, and capital gains income for high net worth of indi individuals from the United States that is never extended to Puerto Ricans." Um, so. So here, so here, I'm I'm going for. Let me go back to the history. Yeah. So the the farmers great. are losing their fa their their lands. Now you go for, flash forward like 10 or 20 years, 1920s, 1930s. The Brookings report showed that, po that Puerto Rico was getting the wages now of farmers working as sharecroppers or as just employees on land that was previously theirs. The wages and Samuel Gompers confirmed this, was less than half than that would than that would what the Spanish have been paying. Wow. Okay, so now at this so, point, right? So there's wow, and, and so then it's really easy then to, yeah, but we up here, it's out of sight, out of mind. We only get little snippets of information, even these days in a media saturated environment with internet. Puerto Rico only registers on the you know, the American radar when there's a hurricane or when there's some, you know, some and disaster. And politicians so go down and visit. And I was going to ask you too. I, I don't want to, to try to you know misdirect you here yeah. you, from your story, but but if you can weave that into uh, you know, the, the American politics and the uh, particularly New York Democratic machine. And again, you served, you were in that assembly. So you saw how this worked here in, in the state side. But, you know, can you weave that in uh, as well? well yeah, I'll get, yeah. yeah, because we're going to go to the P3s a, and the public private partnerships, yes. which is all driven by, by, you know, Wall Street directors and, right. you know, and Wall Street decision Political uh, uh, associates here. So now we're getting to the, into the 30s and um, you've heard the term that when Wall Street 
gets a cold, Harlem gets pneumonia. Or, or, well, that's, you know, sort of, mm -hmm. because the capitalist system was sort of, uh, you know, hanging in the balance at the time, before the Bretton Woods, before they, you know, they, and before FDR, you know, sort of stabilized things, and they pumped, and, you know, they, um, and they, got, uh, they, you know, they changed their philosophy of, of governance here in the United States, but it never did in, in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was always the canary in the, in the coal mine. They were um, just there to be, They've, they've always been an unincorporated territory. In my book, you know, uh, yeah. Teddy Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, FDR, Teddy, uh, 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 just generation after generation saw P Puerto Ricans they, the way they did other light, darker skinned people, people to be helped, tamed, educated, and maybe someday they'll, they'll have some sort of vision of self-governance, of self but certainly not now. Um, and no so, real independence or self-autonomy. And so, and so, and so, 19, by the way, Puerto Rico had just, in 1897, just before the Spanish-American War, had been granted an autonomous government. They had their own local elections for the first time. They had their local parliament. They, had, mm. they sat for about two months until the, the cannonades, the, the, the United States ships uh, bombed San, San Juan Harbor. Mm. Um, but Puerto Rico had, you know, a, a pretty highly developed culture. They have the oldest... Uh, uh, governor's mansion in the world, uh, in, in, uh, in all the Americas. They uh, have a very strong Catholic tra tradition. There's a very highly diversified musical yeah. cuisine, Dance, art, and, right, and, and art. But none of this sort of penetrated the American uh, state of mind. Uh, we were seen as, I mean, on the, st on, on the floor of U.S. Congress, there were, uh, there were senators and, and, and Congress people that were saying that Puerto Ricans were savages, um, and they and they uh, totally incapable of self-government and occasionally cannibals. I mean, it was that kind of percent, and it, was, it, went, wow. it went unquestioned. Um, so, and then so the great wave occurs the f begins in the forties, right? Well, let me just get to, to yeah. in the thirties. Now we have the, the centrales and the four largest ones: Fajardo, Aguirre, East Puerto Rico, Sugar, and Guanica. Owned those four owned half. I told you that that you know, banking syndicates own eighty percent. For just four of those centrales, they were called centrales, these corporate mm. syndicates, owned half the agricultural uh, farmland mm. of, of Puerto Rico. Yeah. They also owned 200 miles of the coastal railroad, uh, about half the utilities, uh, the San Juan Seaport. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a straight out, you know, complete, and it was, just, and it was, it was done incrementally. It was like take, giving the, the farmers their loans, and, you know, all legal, you know, and never with the point of a gun, with a briefcase. And, and it, but it got to the point, the, the critical mass was reached where Puerto Ricans themselves yeah. start questioning themselves. How did this happen? Are, we, are they in fact, you know, do they have some sort of superior? No, mm. they just have better numbers, better technology, they're better organized, and they just, they just grabbed, you know, and, and they were just ahead of the curve. Mm. And the people that finally start realizing this, they have no one to go, no way to go but their own leadership, and their own leadership is collaborating. Now, um, so let me just go forward. We're under the 30. So at that point, things got to starvation level where these farmers could not, literally could not feed their children. When you get to that point, you, you, um, the rules start to change because you no longer, you know, you know, it's no longer a, you know, a debating society. This is really serious. So they, had a, they, they started an island-wide strike, and it got violent. They brought down picket, picket, picket guards. They had to bring in foreigners because the insular police of Puerto Rico, everybody knows each other on, on this island. And yeah, so, yeah. You, you know, if the, the yeah. insular policeman is not going to beat on his cousin or his son because he has to go and deal with his wife that night. Yeah, so sure. so that, that's where the, F, the presence of the FBI started, be, you know, started accelerating because they had to... Hoover. That, uh, yeah, because what, what, what happened is, uh, regarding that, that strike, is that the leadership of the FLI, the Federación Liberal de Trabajo, the FLT, And, and Keppels was leading that. Huh? Keppels? No, he, he wasn't leading. No, he he doesn't happen. Their, exactly. their okay. own uh, union leadership was selling out the rank and file as, you know, okay. historically, you know, that's th th been the case in San Juan in exchange for their own little contracts and their own little, you know, appointments. Okay. Uh, and when the rank and file saw that they were getting sold out and they would get nothing is when they started casting around for, uh, for you know, someone that they could trust and someone that, you know, had the moxie and the intelligence. And so... They yeah, searched him out. Yes. Yeah. That's an important distinction you make in so the So they went to him too. and said, hey, guys... You know, I'm the head of the Nationalist Party. I mean, there's, I mean, just you have guys have to understand that. And they said, look, we can't feed our kids. We we believe that you know we can trust you because he had, when he graduated from Harvard Law School, he got you know he, he was offered all sorts of corporate and State Department sinecures. 
um, including one for the United Fruit. Uh, but he, mm. uh, mm. Abisu Campos turned away from all that. They went back to his hometown of Ponce to open a one-man law firm, basically pra pra uh, practice poverty law because he already had this vision. Mm. He said, mm. I have to go down to the ground level with my people because he came back already a fully formed uh, with a p political and even religious He philosophy. hadn't made. He could have just really yeah. gone into the American oh, he could, You know, token in a sense, right? He could have been one of those sellouts. He could, you know, he you know, gone always. To the su Supreme Court, first Puerto Rican or whatever. All right, but anyway, but so they, they came was true. To and, then, and, 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 and he negotiated on their behalf, right. and it got violent. I mean, they, they shut down the Puerto Rican economy for about eight months during the Depression. And the United States and Wall Street was expecting this, you know, to be able to extract it. That was one secure source of income that they could use to then finance, you know, some of their other dying ventures. Yeah. Right? So I this, see. you know, this was, uh, th there was a matter of urgency and alarm. For, tw for, for when he graduated in, uh, in, uh, uh, in 1918, I mean, he went to war, and then he graduated the year, the year after that. Um, Thereafter, 1980, so we're looking about 15 years where he was editorializing, organizing, traveling around all of South America, uh, making a, you know as much of a presence of himself a, as he could. But in Spanish, you say, and in in su casa lo conocen. They know this guy in his, his house, house, and that's it. House, right, because right. the United States could kill us. They said, oh, whatever these Puerto Rico, oh, these crazy people, oh, you know, oh, my sugar. As he, <laughs> and so uh, they didn't, why, why bother? Yeah. But. When he hurt them in the pocketbook, when he, when Albizu Campos was identified as the leader who was able to galvanize this entire island as never had happened before, and they believed in him, they and knew they, they had a problem. A threat, yeah. And within two months, they had uh, Albizu Campos in jail, un unshackled, on seditious conspiracy against the United States. What was his crime? To represent his own people, because that's what he did, and he did it legally, you know, he did it with NLRB, you know, type of, uh, type of negotiation. He, yeah. he did. And, of course, he was smart enough. He had been a captain in, in, the, in the U.S. Army, where was the level of captain, um, that uh, he knew, you know, how to, you know, some of the, yeah, you know, the sure. more forceful and, you know, uh, practical aspects of, of leading, a, uh, you know, an island-wide movement. So the United States knew that. They, we got to deal with this guy. Well, they dealt with him by get, getting him in jail, and then they had a hung jury the first time they, 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 uh, because the Puerto Ricans, they had, a, you know, a representative sampling of you know which is what it's supposed to be well right. the second jury had That's 10 right. americans and two uh, puerto ricans who were government employees and and then they that sent him to it. atlanta prison for for nine, nine years when he comes back and now in 1940 so now we have to i'm going to go fast forward he comes back uh, to show you how the how this pattern developed and, and there was a uh, there was a consistency to it the first thing they did while, while Albizu Campos was in jail in Atlanta is that they militarized the, the, uh, the, the entire police force and they brought in a new governor named uh, Blanton Winship, who his history, he wasn't an uh, economic developer, he wasn't a diplomat, uh, he uh, uh, didn't have any in international experience. He, had, he was a retired army general whose mm. primary experience was dealing with no Native American populations. Mm. Well, Blanton Winship understood force, fear, and, and oppression. Yeah, he was a military and, guy, yeah. And so they brought him, and then they brought in the chief of police, Riggs. Uh, was e, uh, e. Francis Riggs, whose father was the owner of the Riggs National Bank, the largest bank in Washington, which in turn had subsidized and destabilized a number of regimes throughout, uh, throughout South America over, over the last, the preceding like 20 years. And in, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the first, the immediately preceding gig that E. Francis Riggs had been engaged in was the uh, uh, assassination of Agosto Sandino in Nicaragua. Yeah, and you have him uh, so, quoted so here. So he's a chief of police, and he is the one, he is the one, they, they had a, a massacre called the Rio Piedras Massacre where they, they you know, in open air, they just assassinated yeah, some right. of the nation. And There then, will be war to the death against all Puerto Ricans. Yeah, so what it, Riggs does, he convenes the press, he brings the press of the island I mean, after that, that, the assassinations of the real players of the massacre, he, he knew that, you know, everybody wants to know what's going on here, what happens next. So he convened the press conference to specifically enunciate those words. If Albizu Campos continues to organize the college students and the, and the, uh, the macheteros, the sugarcane workers. So he's like the Bull Connors in a sense. You knew where uh, he stood, and you make that reference too, and now it's, you know, we don't have our Bill Connors. Uh, Connors as much, of course, but we do have other insidious ways of, of, of control. 
Yeah, and they and uh, and they were very open and systematic about it. He he said there'll be war to the death against all Puerto Ricans. Then what they started was something called the Carpetas program. The carpet a carpeta is a file, and by the by the uh, it's like a, a, the, yeah, a yeah. precursor to Interpol. Right. By the end of the, that right. uh, of that program that lasted six dec five to six decades, uh, two generations, two to three generations of Puerto Ricans, they had over two hundred thousand files, eighteen million pages. Uh, wow. On you know, and, and you sometimes you'd have a carpeta and you wouldn't even know, uh, and it, it was and that was a actually um, very oppressive. It, it was you know it was it was really nefarious because w the way that you develop a file is you have to have informants. Right, right. The FBI guys, a lot of them didn't speak Spanish. They didn't. They had no yeah. rules. Everybody was suspicious. And the way you get informants is you start turning one person one yeah. against another. Puerto Rico, anthropologically, you're a sociologist. You yeah. would appreciate that the fact is that when the when the Columbus made his second trip. Yeah, the, the, he landed first in Puerto Rico on his second voyage. The Taino Indians, they, you know, first of all, yeah. they, you know, they never Friendly, seen muskets, gregarious. fire breathing, yeah. you know, ho ho horses, <laughs> uh, these Spanish galleons coming over the horizon. Uh, so they were, you know, kind of intimidated, yeah. but they also they were very gregarious and, and generous. They said they they showed him some uh, some nuggets of gold, mm. and mm. you know, Columbus mm. eyes pop, mm. and he said. Oh, you, oh yeah, they, they showed them where they, you know, they had a like, vein coming down off the mountains because, mm -hmm. and then they, the Spanish mined it so completely that within about 30, 40 years, there's not much left. Um, but they said, here, go, take, take what you want. And that was a big mistake, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah, yeah. what uh, Ponce de Leon came over and what the, the regime that, that they installed well, it forced every Taino to work uh, from the age 14 up and they would have to produce a hawk's bell of gold, a hawk's bell, about this much of gold a month, mm -hmm. or they'd get their hands chopped off. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting uh, no, I'm getting no. Ahead of this myself, is, but but but, but what, what, where we are now is is in Puerto Rico now. Ad right. Abisu Campos goes to jail, and during that time, uh, the same kind of oppression, but now it's a little more sophisticated. Um, mm -hmm. It's information suppression. They have this Carpetas program, and in, in addition, Blanton Blanton Winship starts bringing over FBI agents, and uh, you know, as you know, the FBI uh, at that time was you know. Uh, they knew how to, uh, you know, in so, so, so cor corporations, you, you, uh, you, uh, you extend your reach by color coding your file cabinets and pushing those file cabinets out to the hall and just, you know, pushing your, you know, uh, your presence. Or in a, in a dinner conversation, you, you move the salt shaker forward and forward, mm -hmm. you know, all these, you know, non Well, that's what the FBI would do. They were incredible. J. Edgar Hoover knew how to infiltrate and extend his presence so much that he almost became, you know, a, a a political figure, you know, a worldwide dictator unto himself, and it really yeah, behooved he could control everybody. Yeah. And it behooved the people in Puerto, uh, the the ruling class in Puerto Rico, because they could just bring more FBI agents and more FBI agents, and they're the ones that were creating these carpetas. So between the, uh, the carpetas program, the militarization of the police force, and the F the presence of the FBI, Puerto Rico, I I I have a feeling that that affected the Puerto Rican character. From being generous right. and gregarious because you have such an Could abundance not. of everything. It's of a Garden course. of Eden of into, you know, a little more, you know, uh, a little uh, nitpicky, a little more, uh, no more than sense nitpicky. of co community. It was, it was fractured. Paranoid, perhaps. Yeah, and so because you never knew who was, you know, was, right. was, was King Etava Chotiano King. Who, you, and, and so the, the way you started is the police would bring in uh, Felipe and say, Felipe, uh, we, you're no good. we know you, we know your family and everything, but did you know, look what? at that, uh, Jose, yeah. what he's saying about you? Because in addition, when, Al when Alviso Campos went to jail, when he came back, they created something called uh, a a a Public Law 53. Well, I think it was 53 or 50, I'm 52? sorry. 52? Was it? 52? Public Law 52? It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Which, uh, which was modeled on the Smith Act in the United States, the anti-communist Smith yeah. Act, which yeah. made it a felony punishable by up to 10 years in jail for enunciating any word, saying a word, singing a song, uh, distributing a flyer, Flag and anything yeah. that, that was uh, that any word against the United States or in favor of of Puerto Rico. So, so that Puerto Rico becomes so this testing ground so for so you, things that, that, that were used and, all around the world, too. And, and, and they yeah. abrogated the, the, the First important. Amendment. These are, yeah. these are citizens now. They abrogated right, the entire right, First right. Amendment of, uh, <coughs> for a whole island of people to shut mm. one guy up. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And so, so that's how, you know, how, uh, so how, how openly and uh, ag uh, aggressively and without, without any remorse or whatever, the United States de uh, dealt with Puerto Rico to achieve and maintain their own ends. Um, and so, um, and these things were not evident to me. Uh, I, just to, you know, to backtrack a little personally, um, I became interested in <coughs> this when I, 
when I saw that Aviso Campos was not, didn't exist in, in, in Harvard, in the Widener Library. And I had family in Caguas and other, other places that had been nationalists. So when I would go to, to, to vacation in Puerto Rico, sometimes I would talk to them. And so there, there was this process. Right. So and you so began to learning. learn by, by talking to the people. Yeah. And so actually. in a sense, I was preparing for this book without knowing it. So it was you like could 20 or 30 years of preparation. Yeah. So you're getting the dossiers, in a sense, from the people directly. Then when I saw the dossiers, because uh, Congressman Jose Serrano was able to get the FBI director, Luis Free, at the time, because he was, uh, he was a ranking member of the House Appropriations Committee, which had jurisdiction over the FBI's budget. So, uh, that, so you know, sometimes politics you know, can you know, yield a positive result. They, um, they declassified those 18 million pages of, do of documents. And, and when I saw that is when I, uh, I got curious. I foiled that freedom of information law, some of the information, some of the... And, I, and I, I saw all these FBI documents and have very heavily redacted. And I saw the kind of thing that they were saying that just open libel and slander. They were just destroying lives, you know, without, without compunction. Yeah. And then that reminded me of my, what happened to me with my right. father. Absolutely. And so that is, Absolutely. at that point, is there what I go. said. There you go. There's, I wanna, I, there's a book here. There's a, there's a story here that is not, not on any bookshelf. It's just, you know, a And big not just your story, of course. No, no. Obviously, it, you know, millions. Just, and so that is what I, you know, I went, I'm, I'm not, uh, all my life I haven't been very disciplined, but I'm really good at obsession. And so I became really obsessed with Well, you must have been somewhat disciplined. I mean, you went to Yale Law School. Come on now, give yourself more credit on that. You wrote, the, mean, only thing harder than getting in, the only thing harder than getting yeah, into Yale Law School is looking out. Yeah, and I tested yeah, that. I, well, that's, that's true, yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, no, but, but no, and this is not just, uh, I mean, you've got, how many pages of notes and appendix? Uh, I mean, this is a scholarly work. This is. I, yeah, uh, I'm, you know, I want to tell you something here. This is the first time we've done this show for now almost eight, eight years. Um, we've, got, I mean, we've got only two or three minutes left. Oh, man. I'm no, sorry. I've no, been, no, I've no. no you're going to be. Mean streak here. No, no. Wait. Wait a minute. I've never done this in a show before. But I want... You're going to pay me to come back? Well, I, <laughs> hey, well, we, <laughs> we can work something out, maybe. Poor would you, would you, we still got some time. I want you to yeah. finish with some of your points, but there's so much more to talk about. Would you be willing to come, can we come back? Yeah, now, I, I apologize, because I know that no, I've been, I've been stop, talking over you. No, stop, please, listen, we're, and, and maybe we'll get Felipe to come. Uh, we're going to, we're going to tie Felipe now. We're going to, okay, well, you are know, you, how about next, are you, I, I've got an opening next week or the following week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, so do you, this is I'll on, no, no, I, all right. I'll do it. I mean, we'll just pick up what we'll we pick left up, off we'll, and you apologize to your audience for me. No, that, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're but riveted. there is a really dense, okay. can I go just ahead. leave with one thing here? You can There's do way, okay, two so damage, right go now, ahead. Let me just leave with this. There's no, something called P3s, public-private partnerships. Okay. Are, and Puerto Rico are P5s, public-private partnerships for the plunder of Puerto Rico. First, Puerto Rico was a naval coaling station. Then it became this one-crop cash cow economy. Then it became a 20-year tax break of so interest, dividend, capital gains income, especially for the pharmaceuticals. At one point, Puerto Rico was producing 25% of the world's pharmaceutical drugs. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that. The 936, the IRS 936 exception. Now, the deal is when Puerto Rico went under, when, they, when the 936 lapsed, all these uh, Wall Street bond traders came in with these very creative financial instruments, you know, uh, credit default swaps, and, and they, info they injected Puerto Rico with an entirely new level of debt, knowing full well no, that, that it, it was it, that it was in, unconstitutional because it exceeded the debt, the debt ceiling that, that was. It was the same damn thing that happened up here. Right? In Here the in States York, in 2007 in, or whenever it was. In New York or in Washington? Yeah. In, 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 in New York. Oh, in Washington. Yeah. Well, so it was yeah, a they bought a financial it, control board. But the difference ahead. being that it's yeah. a financial control board that was from within its own, uh, within its own uh, universe. It was a okay. financial. This is a, one government imposing a financial control board on an island that's been victimized. Right. Okay. And that, that, that they, that it, we'll talk, I'll talk about the next time, what the, the nature of the debt. It's like a Ponzi scheme where they, 83% of, of a succession of series AA bonds were, pay, were used not to pay uh, infrastructure repair, salaries, Interest. purchase of oil for PREPA, the, the oil, but to pay, and not even to pay the, the capital no, on the antecedent right. debt, to pay the interest no, on the preceding loan. 83%. Yes. Never okay. ending. Okay, so now, Never. and so, but now it's here, so, and I'll leave, I'll leave with this, is that these P3s, these public-private partnerships, what they're doing, they're taking the, the public infrastructure of Puerto Rico, hospitals, schools, that, right. the public lands that are owned, the government, and they're using them as collateral for these debts. 
Yeah, so yeah, now yeah, yeah. Put, they'll turn the, the public infrastructure portico into one giant ATM for Wall Street. Deeper and deeper. And that's where, that's where it's headed. Thanks. Thank you so very, very much. Nelson, it is a pleasure, honor. This is a terrific, terrific book. Please get it. And we'll see you again next week on The Radical Imagination. Thank you again. Get them out of here! Hello, my name is Rogelio Yola, and I'm looking for a job. Yes, uh, I have a college degree from the Instituto Tecnológico de Santo Domingo and I'm willing to work very hard. I am very well known in the neighborhood. I love New York and I have excellent reference. Your call is very important to me. Please leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. The one thing that drove my life was coming to America. The land of opportunities. The land of the free, where all men I created equal. I am willing to travel, work overtime, and my salary, no problem. I will work with your budget. In fact, any offer at this point is a great offer. I'm fully bilingual with a strong skills in computers, and I love to cook lasagna. I'm also a firm believer in the words of the great Ronald Reagan. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the Shining City all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God blessed and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here.